Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here, I appreciate it a lot. Today's video is going to be an in-depth one-on-one course, if you will, on forging Damascus steel, AKA pattern welded steel. So if you have never made Damascus steel before, or maybe you have a couple of times and haven't quite got the results that you want, or want to learn a little more, this video is for you. My goal with this video is that you can come to it with zero previous knowledge of how to actually forge Damascus or pattern welded steel. And then after the video, go out to your shop and using the instructions that I'm going to provide, make your own Damascus steel. So stick around. All right, before we get into it, we do need to cover terminology here because this is a oft debated subject, particularly on the internet and things like that in different forums, etc. What we are making what we're calling Damascus steel or pattern welded steel is not historic Damascus steel. Most people know that. There are some people that insist on using correct terminology. However, it's not quite that simple. Historic Damascus steel uh, is not made the way that we're going to make this pattern welded steel. Uh, the way it received its pattern was largely from different alloy components that were naturally occurring in different ores or um, iron ores in different regions particularly of the Middle East. So these alloying elements like vanadium and some others would create carb carbide clusters in different ways and create the pattern that way. That's the primary way that historic Damascus received its pattern which is much more faint than, than your pattern welded steels of today. And these alloy elements and depending on how the steel was worked, also served to create a generally superior blade at that point in time. And that is where the Damascus steel gained the legendary status that still holds today. Even though modern steels and methods are superior and the performances you're going to get from them when properly worked is going to be superior as well. There are some things that, many things we don't know about how Damascus steel was made. There have been several people who believe they have discovered how it's done. Uh, but like I said, we're not doing that here today. So why are we calling this Damascus steel? That's a very good question. So several decades ago, um, a guy named Bill Moran, or is it Moran? I don't know. Um, anyway, I should know that because he was the founding or one of the founding members of the American Bladesmith Society and in many ways uh, you could say the godfather or even the father of modern custom knife making. And he learned how to make pattern welded steel which is what we do today and he introduced that several decades ago at a knife show and called it Damascus steel. The reason he called it Damascus steel to my knowledge is because of the pattern, the Damascene pattern on the blade because of the pattern welded steel. And this isn't something new. Um, various different articles of pattern welded steel or similar methods have been called Damascene or Damascus for some time. And so most people in the custom knife world have followed the lead and call pattern welded steel Damascus steel. Is it historically technically correct? No, but the idea is not to mislead anybody. By and large, everybody knows that it's not historic Damascus steel. So we're going to operate off of that heritage, if you will, today. And when I'm referring to Damascus steel, I'm talking about pattern welded steel. So now that we've established that we are working with pattern welded steel, AKA Damascus, what is it that actually makes it Damascus steel as far as the pattern or the aesthetic appeal goes? Well, there are a couple different ways that you can achieve uh, patterns in pattern welded steel. And one way is to use steels of drastically differing carbon levels. And so let's say I would take a piece of 1095 high carbon steel and a piece of low carbon steel or mild steel, forge weld those together. And then I can etch those in some kind of acid solution, usually ferric chloride or something like that. And the carbon content in the steels is going to cause the steels to react to the acid differently and therefore reveal the different layers of steel that have been welded together. Now there's some drawbacks to this, namely mild steel does not make a good blade steel. So if you're going to do that, you're gonna run the risk unless you 
prepare against this of having mild steel somewhere in the edge of your blade which of course would not be good because a knife needs to have certain properties to uh, work properly and be a good knife. So that's probably one of the most the major drawbacks to that, that potential method. More commonly and across the board as far as I know the way we make Damascus steel is by combining a couple of different steels that both make good blade steels. And the first one that I'll bring up is 15 and 20 or something similar. Any steel that has a high nickel content, one and a half to two percent. There are other steels like this that could work such as L6 or 8670 even perhaps, but whatever the case, we want a steel that has enough carbon content in it to make a good blade steel and enough nickel in it to resist the acid during the etch at the end of the knife making process to reveal and construct the pattern that's already there. The second steel that we're going to combine with this high nickel content steel, usually 15 and 20, is some kind of carbon steel that doesn't have nickel in it but also makes a very good blade steel. Now there's a range of options available such as 1075, 1080, 1084, 1095, even into the deep hardening steel such as 01, um, you name it. You really can combine a wide range of steels but you do have to be aware specifically of the different heat treating requirements and things like contraction rates of differing steels. And so for that reason, most people use a steel that is very similar in chemical composition to 15 and 20, but simply without the nickel content. And so generally that puts us in the area of 1080, 1084, and my personal favorite, 1095. Now I know I've just done a lot of talking so far, but bear with me because I'm laying the groundwork for a basic working knowledge of what it is that we're trying to accomplish here with Damascus Steel. And so I do want to answer one question real quick <clears throat> that you probably have heard, and, and if you're a knife maker for very long, people are going to ask you, and that is, is Damascus Steel better than non-Damascus Steel? And I think the reason people ask this is because of the legendary status that Damascus Steel has from eons ago and like I mentioned earlier back then it generally was superior and even in, in many cases far superior to a lot of the other blade steels and weapons that were available at the time but speaking of modern days pattern welded steel is it better well that's a good question what it really boils down to though is your blade is never going to be any better than number one the materials that you're using and number two the process you use to work that steel. And so personally, when I like to combine 1095 high carbon steel and 15 and 20 steel, both good blade steels, I have to work that steel, forge that steel, heat treat that steel properly in order to get the full potential out of both of those steels together. Now, there are some contexts in which a Damascus or pattern welded steel blade can be better than one of this one of the involved steels by itself and I'll give an example here so for example 15 and 20 is, is a very tough steel and it's often used in industries for sawmill blades and things like that because of its toughness now it also has about 0.8 percent carbon in it and that makes it a good blade steel and then conversely for example 1095 it can also be a very tough steel but not quite as tough as the higher nickel content steel the high nickel content steel but it has more carbon in it and therefore potentially better abrasion resistance if heat treated properly. So when we're combining these two steels, we're combining those two slightly different characteristics into one blade and if done properly, you can see how those two benefits working together could make a superior blade to just one of these steels by themselves. And so as far as that goes, there are instances assuming everything else is in the right place, where a pattern welded steel or Damascus steel blade could in fact, and is in fact, better than simply a mono steel blade. One of the things you may run into is people with the idea or belief that a pattern welded, forge welded blade like that with the different layers is inferior to a mono steel blade because of the weakness of the weld potentially. And basically what that is, is perhaps they've had an experience with a very poor quality Damascus or pattern welded blade. A properly made Damascus or pattern welded blade is going to be every bit as strong and, and like I mentioned just a minute ago, in some cases even performing better than a mono steel blade. And I've, I've um, 
borne that out in a, in a previous video where I used a Damascus steel blade that I made to chop through 2x4 multiple, multiple times, six times I believe, and still be able to shave hair off of my arm. And so it is not the, the fact that it's a Damascus steel blade, it would be the fact that it's not properly made. And that's true with any knife and any blade, mono steel or otherwise. Okay, so with that knowledge, our goal is to make a high performance knife, a high performance blade out of this Damascus or pattern welded steel. Yes, it's going to look really cool and, and be beautiful, but that should not at any point sacrifice the functionality, in my opinion, of this tool. And so from here on out, that's going to be the focus of this video. How do we get a high performing, high quality blade out of Damascus steel? All right, let's talk about tools real quick. I'm gonna operate under the assumption that you probably don't have a power hammer or a press if you're just getting into Damascus steel and therefore I'm not going to be using my press in this video. Likewise, I'm going to assume that if you are looking to get into Damascus steel, you've probably been forging blades for a little while and have gained some skill in that area and therefore probably have a grinder and a cheap welder or something like that. And so I am going to be using those tools. By the same token, I'm not going to make a super high layer count uh, billet because of the fact that I'm just going to be using a hand hammer, but that doesn't matter. You can use the same principles with any number of a reasonable number of layers in a billet to achieve the same results. All right, so the first thing we need to do is create a bunch of pieces of steel to stack up and make our billet out of. And my personal preference and what I would recommend is buying bars of steel from a knife company that are spiritized or annealed. It's a form of annealing, which means they're soft not hard, and have been pickled or the scale cleaned off of the steel from the hot rolling process. This is going to make it much easier to get a super clean piece of steel on the grinder instead of having to grind off that scale, which is a pain, which ironically is what I'm doing here today, but nevertheless it's the same process. Sometimes the steel can be clean enough from the manufacturer that you simply need to wipe it clean with some sort of uh, cleaning solution and you can stack it up right from there. If there's any kind of rust, scale, or oxidization of any kind on there, you do need to clean that off. I'm going to go ahead and cut this steel up into a bunch of pieces and we can start putting our billet together. Okay, so I have my stack of high carbon steel here, in this case 1095, and my stack of 15 and 20 high nickel content steel here. The next step is to grind clean each surface of each piece of steel so that we have no barriers of oxide, dirt, or anything like that in between that would inhibit the weld. Okay, I have my pieces of steel ground clean on a 40 grit belt. You can use a 60 or whatever. Uh, I like 40 grits for a lot of stuff like this. And as you can see, there's some dust on here, a little bit of that. You don't want any particulate matter, non-ferrous particulate matter, in between the layers of your steel because that will create tiny pinholes or pockets in your finished product, and we do not want that. So. It's important that we make sure that even if we have to come back and wipe the steel clean with a cloth, that we do that. Theoretically, it would be clean enough right off the grinder, but being as things are, and the dirt, the floor that I have in my shop, things like that, it's very easy for dust or something like that to get on here, and we don't want that. So make sure those are wiped clean. All right, we need to talk about the forge because there is a lot of different, um, factors that come into play with a successful forge weld. And the forge is a big part of that, obviously, because we are heating our steel up in the forge. Now, the main thing that will create a flaw in your forge weld 
is some kind of oxidization or oxidization that's caused in some various way. That is going to be the most common thing that inhibits those two pieces of steel from bonding together in the forge weld. It creates a barrier, oxidization creates a barrier that the steel cannot bond together um, through. And so that's the purpose of grinding the steel clean. Another thing that's important is to make sure that once we have the steel clean, no oxidization uh, forms during or before the forge weld. And we do that through several different ways. So I'm gonna talk about the forge next. So this is a pretty basic soft fire brick forge that I built with what's known as a frosty tea burner. This is an atmospheric or venturi style burner. There's no forced air. What happens is the gas shoots down out of a jet through this tube and upon ignition down here in the forge it creates a low, uh, a low pressure system inside the forge and there's much higher pressure outside and that's literally what forces air in and down the tube as it continues to burn. What you can see here is that I have some little flaps of steel that I actually use some magnets on the back side to attach. It's just a handy little way to do it. And I can adjust these up and down to adjust the air intake into this burner and that is important. Now I do recommend that your burner have some kind of air intake adjustment on it. Now the original Frosty T burner design allows for adjusting the, the flame by shortening the jet that's inside, and you can't see, let me hold on, shortening the jet that's inside, there it is, of the burner. And that affects how much air the burner assimilates uh, during operation. Unfortunately, that's obviously not easily adjusted for different conditions or, or applications, and so I much prefer this system, which allows me to adjust it down to a low carburizing flame, or, or even up into a, a high oxidizing flame if I'm just after as much quick heat as I can get, <clears throat> and I'm not worried about oxidization for certain applications. Now on, on forge welding applications, you want to have a neutral or even carburizing flame. A neutral flame is one in which theoretically all of the available oxygen that is coming into the forge burner is being used up in combustion with the fuel. A oxidizing flame is where there is extra oxygen and we do not want that because oxidization on steel happens of course when the steel reacts with oxygen. Now this happens in different circumstances like with rust, but it happens very rapidly at high temperatures, which is the forge scale that you see on your pieces of steel, and that's what we don't want. A carburizing flame is where there is a, a deficit of oxygen and actually extra fuel, and depending on what type of fuel you're burning, you actually have available carbon. Now that not, doesn't necessarily do anything for you, but it does make sure that you don't have oxygen creating oxidization and that's very important. Okay, another way that we make sure that oxidization does not happen on our clean steel before or during a forge weld is through using flux or some other kind of barrier. You can do things like zero atmosphere forge welds in which you encase the entire billet in, in a sheet piece of mild sheet steel, something like that. Um, there's other methods you can even use uh, diesel, uh, WD-40, kerosene, different things that will help shield the steel for a period of time and allow you to get that forge weld set. You can actually even, if you are very careful with your prep and have very clean flat pieces of steel, if they mate close enough and tight enough together in the billet and you have a neutral or carburizing atmosphere or, or flame on your forge, it is possible to forge weld without any flux or barrier whatsoever just because of the appropriate atmosphere and the tight fitting pieces in your billet. I'm not going to explore that method today because this is obviously a one-on-one video. And so we'll be using the most common method which is flux. And what flux is, is borax and sometimes other components. This is 20 meal team borax from the grocery store. It's commonly used for household uh, cleaning and, and laundry and that kind of thing. And what happens is you sprinkle it on the steel at a certain temperature, it melts and creates a barrier and keeps oxygen from reaching the steel, but it also acts as something like an acid that actually dissolves uh, oxidization or oxide 
at high temperatures and so it actually helps clean the steel as well as shield it from oxygen. It's important to keep your borax in an airtight sealed container, particularly when you live in a humid environment. And if you don't do that, you're going to, it's going to assimilate a lot of moisture, which has to be basically cooked out of the borax when you put it on the steel. And while it will still work, it's going to be a little inconvenient and won't, it won't work as readily or as quickly. So keep it in an air container. Another reason that this is so important is that if you have grit and dust in your shop, it's going to get in here if it's not sealed, and that can actually create tiny pinhole flaws in your weld that you won't see until after you grind the whole billet and make a knife out of it. So keep it in an airtight sealed container. Don't ask me how I know that. It was a <laughs> hard learned lesson. So now I have it in this. Glass might not be the best, but that's what I have, and at least it's protected and clean. Okay, now that we've covered some preliminary information about why we're doing certain things that we're doing, we can start stacking our bill and prepping it for the forge weld. One more thing I need to mention about the forge, it is worth it to heat your forge up prior to starting the forge weld. A good time is, you know, 15 minutes to half an hour even. Get that forge up to heat. It won't be a waste of fuel, trust me. It's gonna make things uh, just a lot smoother and easier to have your forge doing what it's supposed to be doing as you prep everything else. So heat that up. I'm gonna start that forge up now and get that heated up before I even go any further with prepping the billet. One thing I do wanna point out is that there are various different methods like I alluded to earlier concerning flux or ways to shield your steel from oxidization. But what I'm doing today is I'm showing you a basic commonly used uh, scheme of methods in order to get a solid uh, forge weld and so I'm going to stick with sort of a, a basic line of method and that's going to get you these results. Once you master these it's a lot of fun to branch out and try different methods and ways of doing things and, and reaching the same goal. Okay, I have a little seven layer billy here. It's clean, free of any dirt, grit, or otherwise. And it's not a high layer count, obviously, but that's okay because we're working with a hammer and we can do several welds on this and exponentially increase our layer count. And for the purpose of this video, we are doing this by hand completely. So I'm gonna go ahead and clamp these together so that they're nice and tight and uh, run some beads and I'll show you how to do that to keep the whole billet together before we go into the forge. So we've taken the time to carefully clean off the surfaces of the steel and keep those flat as possible in the grinder. This is also very important. And now we have them clamped together. We want to keep those pieces of steel as close together the entire time up until the forge weld as much as possible. And so to accomplish that, we're going to run some welding beads on each corner. Now this is a three inch long billet and the outside layers are 3 16 inch thick. And with those dimensions, it's possible to keep that tightly together without doing too much welding on this. But once you get into thinner sections of steel, like eighth of an inch or thinner, or even a longer billet, when those heat up, they tend to bow up, and that's not good. So on a longer billet or thinner sections, I would run at least one bead across the middle and probably two or even three, depending on the length of the billet and the thickness of the stock, to make sure that that steel doesn't bow up and create a gap between those layers that could cause real problems in the forge weld. 
Okay, I have my billet prepped. It's tight. It's welded together on both ends, and I have a, a uh, little piece of stock welded on so that I can grab it with the tongs in and out of the forge. At this point, I'm going to put it in the forge, and we'll start heating it up towards the forge weld heat. Now, we can't really put flux on until the steel is heated up somewhat, and this is one reason why it's important to make sure that your forge is burning at a neutral or carburizing flame to keep that oxygen away from the steel as much as possible. One indication of your forge running at a neutral or carburizing flame is the color of flame that's emitting from the opening of the forge. In this case, you want to see like a dark orange down to even a blue color almost of the flame that's coming out of the forge. Other ways to adjust your forge is to look at the flame upon lighting the forge before the entire inside of the forge is heated up. You can't really see much then, but when you first light the forge you can see a blue cone to the flame right up against where the burner enters the forge. And that should be one and a half to two inches long. And as you adjust the air intake you can watch that blue cone change a little bit and then the flames that are emitting down from that as it burns. You want sort of a longer, lazier flame that's a darker orange color. Those are indicators of a neutral to carburizing flame. The sound that the forge the burner makes as well is also an indicator. A, a fully opened up uh, burner, if you will, that has as much or more oxygen than it needs, it's going to sound like a, a jet engine. And as you adjust that down, it's going to become more muted and the, the uh, Venturi a little bit slower. So these are all indicators. And you can go online to find charts of different um, burner pictures that show you the difference between uh, or flame pictures that show you the difference between uh, neutral oxidizing or carburizing flames. I want this billet to heat up as evenly as possible so I'm going to turn it in the forge as it heats up. I want that to be more or less evenly heated and then I'll go ahead and put flux on it. But we want to do that as soon as possible, possible and before the steel reaches a high orange or even yellow heat. before it is possible to not use flux and so theoretically if our billet is nice and tight and there is not an allowance for air to get in there to speak of um, then that's going to be fine until we do get that flux on there but now that we have the flux on there it's going to provide that protective uh, covering to the steel and anywhere that there is a gap that is big enough for it to get into with capillary action, it will do that and it will do its work in there. Capillary action is, done, is happens with surface tension when um, a liquid is able to uh, disperse itself in an area, it's particularly in this case between two pieces of steel, so it will literally suck, it will be sucked into those gaps through capillary action, and that's how that works. At this point, I'm going to wait for the steel to heat up a little bit more, and you can go ahead and pack the steel, and in some cases, that is a good idea, and what that is is simply tightening the layers together even more prior to the actual forge weld. What I'm gonna do in this case is because I have the billet tight and nice 
in a nice uh, tight stack as it is. I'm just going to bring it up to welding heat and then we're going to go ahead and set the weld. We need to talk about how it is that we're going to hammer on this billet to effectively set this weld. So I'm going to draw a picture here of our billet and this is the handle here that's welded on for us to hold onto it with the tongs. Now, what we do not want to do is have any kind of pocket or gap created anywhere in this billet. And since we have flux on there and any potential tiny gaps between those layers of steel, we want to make sure that that, that flux is forced out of the billet and the, the pieces of steel are able to uh, weld together without any kind of gap. So to, to accomplish that as best as possible, we're going to hammer down the center of this billet, not with heavy blows, more like a tap, but firm, steady blows quickly, and we're going to hammer down the center of the steel, and then we can go down the side and down the other side. And this is going to force any flux away from the center and allow us to weld the steel from the center out. And if we were to set the weld on this side first or this side, we could potentially do that, but then we would have to hammer only from this side and force everything all the way out this way. And I think it's better that we force it only half of the way, a half of the width of the steel, if that makes sense, than try to go from one side all the way over like that. Now be advised, molten flux is going to fly when you hammer on this, as well as scale and other things on the outside of the steel. So safety gear is advisable, an apron is advisable, which I'm gonna go put on right now. Now, gloves are advisable. Any protective gear that you deem necessary to keep yourself safe, just be advised that it is somewhat dangerous and a lot of fun. I prefer to use a rounding hammer to set my welds, and a rounding hammer, of course, has that domed face on one side of the hammer, and that essentially allows this action that we talked about, forcing that out from the center, any, any gaps or flux that is in there, this rounding hammer accentuates that action. That's why I like to use that for this initial setting of the welds. Okay, hopefully you were able to get an idea of the force of the hammer blows that I was using and see that pattern that I talked about uh, that we're hammering to set that weld. So let me talk about welding temperature really quick and how to judge that because that is important. So uh, getting your steel up to welding temperature is necessary for it to weld together. And the welding temperatures of steel vary depending on the carbon content in them. The lower the carbon content, the higher the necessary welding temperature. Depending on the type of equipment you use, that also comes into play as well. If you have something like a press or a power hammer that's putting a lot more uh, force and mass behind that, just that that is going to help the steel uh, fuse together, weld together as well. We're not doing that in this case. So what are some indicators of a proper welding temperature that will allow you to solidly weld that billet together? Well, let me cover one first that you probably perhaps have heard of, and that is what's called dragon's breath. And that is where you see sparks starting to emit from your forge. And what that is, is the carbon is beginning to burn off in your steel. Now, while this dragon's breath is a sure indicator that you're up to a temperature that will allow you to weld your steel together successfully, assuming everything else goes as it should, I don't recommend it because it's higher than it needs to be. And the higher that you heat your steel, the more potential damage you're doing to it that has to be corrected later. Or in some cases, too much damage has been done and it can't be corrected. I don't like to burn my steel whatsoever, and that is burning your steel. So indicators that I like to use are a couple of these. First of all, watching the flux on your steel. When it starts to bubble consistently across the surface of the steel, and the steel's been in there long enough to reach that temperature through the entire billet, that's one good indicator. Another one is when you take it out of the forge, and there's literally a halo effect around the billet that you can see, and it looks like it's steaming, that's a really good indicator as well. And those are a couple that I like to use. I'm gonna go ahead and take this billet out of the forge again and run back over it again just to make sure that we're good to go on our welds and then we can start drawing it out. 
indicators that tell you that your forged weld has been successful and your billet is one solid piece of steel now. The way it cools, so watching this billet start to cool down, you can see here at the corners it's a little darker and some of the extremities, if you will, that are further away from the massive heat in this block of steel, and those are going to be darker as they cool a little faster. But one sure indicator that you do not have a solid forge weld is if you look at your piece of steel, your billet, and perhaps from this layer over, the steel is significantly darker and this is significantly hotter. If you see any distinct lines like that, that's a pretty good indicator almost 100% of the time that, from my experience, that you don't have a solid forge weld. Now as you can see, as it continues to cool down, the end here is, is cooler than over here in the middle, but it's consistent. It, it, it makes sense, so to speak. There's no like specific lines where it has started to cool significantly more. It's, it's, all, it's all pretty inclusive. Okay, now that we have a solid billet, a successful forge weld, we need to draw this steel out so that we can cut it up into pieces, restack and re-weld it to affect whatever layer count that we're after. Now in this case, since I'm doing this by hand, I'm not gonna go for a super higher layer count, but nevertheless, we can get a nice bold pattern on this blade that I'm gonna make out of this uh, with this process. It's important to note that you don't, at any point, of course, want to forge steel too cold, and that is still true in this case with the Damascus steel. Okay, before I go too far, I do want to talk about one more thing that is important, and that is heat sinks. Your anvil, as it sits here at room temperature, is a giant heat sink, which means it pulls all the heat out of whatever you set on it. And when it comes to forging, that means it really reduces your amount of time that you can forge at a proper heat, this kind of thing. Which is one reason why the, once your anvil warms up, particularly at very cold temperatures, your forging becomes a lot more efficient. This is a problem when setting a forge weld, or it can be a problem setting a forge weld. That lower layer, whatever is sitting on the anvil, you know, it's 3 sixteenths, maybe, maybe a little thicker, maybe thinner, that anvil is going to suck that heat away from that layer of steel and it can very easily um, not allow that steel to forge weld to the rest of the billet. So, a couple of ways to avoid this is to heat the anvil up to a nice hot operating temperature simply by heating up a sizable block of steel, setting it on there. Uh, another thing that some guys do is they have a little tool that goes in the hardy hole here that can be heated up on its own and sets in there and uh, use that as the, as the surface for setting the weld. And another thing that might help is setting the weld on one side putting it back in the forge, making sure there's still enough flux on everything, pull it out, flip it over, and then set the weld again so that the top side is going to theoretically be set fine because it hasn't had the heat sucked out of it. And if you need to go back and, and uh, make sure that the bottom is okay as well, that's another technique that you can use to uh, do that. So be aware of that. This can cause welds to fail particularly on the outside surface or outside edges of the billet. And if you don't notice them, um, then they can potentially end up in the middle of your billet somewhere down the road as we restack and re-weld this. So make sure you double check that. One way to double check that is to begin, as you begin forging it on the bias, like edge up instead of flat stack on the edge as you're forging it. If those layers in any way start to separate, then you don't have a solid forge weld there and you need to address that before moving on. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, but right here there is a little a little bit of a uh, flaw or delamination. Not, not that, but right here, this top layer where it doesn't appear to have welded. I think that was just like I was talking about. I set this side down on the anvil first without um, heating up the anvil and I don't think I quite got that completely welded. As it's cooling down, it's really hard to tell. I don't see anything severe and it could just be the, the, the steel is kind of curled over from that end or the side of that steel 
and creating what looks like a gap there, but now you can see it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take that to the grinder and just grind that off and see if I can get down to some uh, solid steel before we move on any further. Okay, you can see we do have a problem here. There is a gap down inside there and it's weeping, maybe flux or something, I'm not sure. I'm gonna try to fix this. I'm gonna go ahead and get some flux on this, get it back in the forge, see if we can do, uh, work, it, work it from the middle out and get that closed up. Okay, I think we got it. I think we're able to go ahead and use that method I was talking about and just seal that back up, get that welded, and it looks like we're good to go. So you can see the different layers of the nickel steel between the high carbon steel, and that's just because of the way the nickel content reacts differently to the heat, but there are no gaps, there's no flaws, and so we're good to go to continue drying this out. And hopefully we were able to get that entire piece welded up and not any pockets in the uh, in the billet whatsoever. I think so. And we'll just uh, keep going forward. Okay, I have this forged out after a lot of hammering, of course. And it's pretty flat and um, pretty much the same thickness. You really want to try to have this the same thickness all the way through here, if at all possible and um, as, as smooth or flat as possible as well. That's a little difficult to do with just a hammer. If you have a flatter or something like that, then it's a little easier. I don't have one of those. This will be sufficient though. We're gonna cut this up into three pieces and then grind all this scale off and re-stack this for another forge weld. Okay, we have our pieces ground, cleaned up, ready for the next weld. And it goes without saying that uh, these surfaces and this weld is just as important as the first one because it's all gonna go into our finished blade. So the same amount of care and preparation is, is important here as well. So we have our second forge weld set. Everything is looking good. At this point in the game, once you've reached your layer count that you want, in this case it is rather low, but uh, because of how we're doing it and for the sake of the video, you, you start thinking about what kind of pattern you're going to introduce into the, to the billet. And you can simply forge out this piece of steel without doing much anything else. It is going to give you a, a randomized and neat looking pattern. And that's because every time you hammer on that steel and displace 
the steel in a random way, those layers are disturbed. Uh, and so on the finished product, it's not going to look like just a bunch of straight lines. So I mean, that's, that's good, right? Because that would be kind of boring. There are ways to get straight lines if that's what you're after, but that's not what this is going to look like. And so if I just forge this out as it is, it's gonna have a, a neat random pattern to it. Uh, but you can also do other things. You can forge it to a square or, or slightly round uh, bar and twist it. You can forge it out a little bit thinner, cut shallow grooves in it with various um, tools and forge it further. And that's a, a, a ladder pattern. Uh, you can drill shallow holes in it and forge it out flat. That, that's a raindrop pattern. There's lots of different things you can do. But for the sake of this video, I am going to go with a basic randomized pattern and just go ahead and forge our billet out uh, to some dimensions that will make that will allow me to make a good knife and forge a blade out of that. And, um, and, and more, more pattern making in the actual steel that's, that's uh, material for another video. And everything in this video is gonna give you a good foundation to start exploring how to build those patterns as we go. So let's get back on this billet, get it forged out, and we'll make ourselves a nice little blade. All right, we have a blade forged out from our little Damascus billet. Here it is, and just a couple things to go over real quick here. So you see this uh, excess material right here, a little bit that I forged over the edge of the anvil. Purpose of that is to exclude the very end of our billet from the tip. And the reason is because typically the very end of your billet is gonna have some small delaminations or uh, layers that didn't weld together. I think just because of the spot welding it kind of that kind of affects that right there at the end pretty typical so we don't th don't want that in in the knife and the same thing out here on the end that'll that'll get ground off so i've got about half an inch extra on the end of the tang here and then of course i'll go i'll come back and define the the um i guess it would be the ricasso area a little bit and the profile a little bit but it's all it's all there as it needs to be at this point also i'll point out that i did leave the blade thickness the same all the way through. I did not forge any bevel on this blade. You can. The reason I didn't is because I want to be able to grind through and expose as many of the layers that we have in this blade as possible to, to make the most use of the layers. So that's the reason for that. And um, that's, kind of, that's kind of it guys. So um, I'll, uh, I'll post a picture of the finished knife here either in this video or on the channel so you can see the fruits of our labor here. But I appreciate you guys watching as always, and we'll see you on the next video.